uh, this is just uh, in this case. If the inspector gets around all his jails, then the guidance is to go back to problem jails. In other words, to schedule himself back to ones that have problems, to see if we can help them out or whatever we can do to expedite. We also go on complaints. Uh, we get a complaint, a written complaint or a valid complaint. I contact the inspector and I pull him off his regular schedule to respond to complaints. That big truck isn't just parked there. It's been chained to a fence by the man who owns the land. He did it to prevent Atlantic Richfield from getting by. Arco has held a lease to this land since 1965, but they only began drilling a well eight days ago. I want them off of here until the court settles whether they have a right to be here or not. I don't think they do. They say they do. We diligently pursued uh, getting permits up until we finally did get them in October, uh, the first week of October of this year. And it is under those permits that we are now attempting to drill additional wells in this section to save our leases. I don't want to tie your equipment up, I just want it off. Okay, here. we'll get her off already. Right. Mighty fine. To break the stalemate, McNaughton agreed to move his truck long enough for Arco to remove its equipment. But by leaving, Arco still wasn't admitting McNaughton was right. Randy Phipps thinks McNaughton just wants to break the ARCO lease so he can sell new leases for more money. McNaughton says he wants to put a housing development on this land and have a well in another part of the 160-acre quarter section. McNaughton said he hadn't signed a new lease when ARCO began drilling. He won't comment as to whether he signed a new lease since then. This isn't the first time ARCO's been blocked out of a piece of land. That first dispute will be settled in a county court beginning next Monday and the way that case is decided may have a decisive bearing on Marvin McNaughton's right to keep Arco chained out. Phil Ross, Action 4, Near Enid. I would like to think that there is some special magic to supply-side economics and that you can cut your revenues three times greater than you cut your expenses and have a balanced budget. I wish I were able to wear those kinds of glasses that could see clearly that kind of scenario. Unfortunately, I cannot, and unfortunately so far, that kind of scenario hasn't come true. So magic... There is no halfway for Rosie. She's either waiting or working. And when she's working, it's non-stop until the patient is safe inside the hospital. She carries a tremendous responsibility that many have buckled under. The only real problem for Rosie has been the pain. It's hard to watch people suffer night after night and not be affected. After six years, she's finally learning to detach herself. You finally come to realize that the people that are hurt, you know, they're the ones that hurt. You know, it just doesn't do any good for you to get upset about it. People die, their families are the ones that hurt. You know, your hurt is just little compared to that. They're the ones that hurt.
have some kind of picture back on the machine. There are a dozen stories of life and death every day in the intensive care unit. In each room, patients and nurses are working together towards one goal, staying alive. Be it someone just out of surgery, like this man, or someone fighting a battle against a terminal disease. They're all here, and they all need special care. Is that sinus, or? It's, it's probably a sinus. The nurses? Well, they like the fast pace, the action. They find a challenge few have in a job. It's satisfying to know that there will be days when a patient will come so very close to death, only to be saved by their nursing skills. Okay. And as a head nurse, it's rewarding to see the unit work so well as a team. The satisfaction is whenever the family members come up to me and say, boy, you got a team in there that's just great. Either mama or daddy or my wife has made it because you've got good nurses in there. <laughs> then you feel like you've done your job because you've screened the proper people and you've got them trained highly enough that they can, you know, do the job. Gracious. I'm a person who, who likes to relate to people. I care about people and I've, I've considered a very precious blessing that I've been able to be educated and, and be in the, in the position that, that I'm in, in which I can earn a living, but also help people that, who have significant problems that alters their lifestyle. And I can intervene in that situation and allow that person to, to go back and, and live an essentially uh, normal life. Uh, on occasion, it means uh, taking someone who is, is near death, and I, I don't like to use the term saving their life, but in essence, uh, that's part of what uh, the end result. It takes a special person to be a nurse at the Baptist Burn Center. They have to show compassion and support under the most trying circumstances. It's not easy to be cheerful when your patient is in extreme pain, but you have to be brave for both of you. 
we tell them at the beginning they are never going to be pain free from the time they enter till they leave yeah. uh, there will always be a certain amount of pain and uh, our psychiatrist uh, helps them cope with pain and my nurses are very uh, compassionate with these patients nursing at the baptist burn center is definitely not for everyone but for the person who is dedicated it's a blend of pleasure and sadness that is unequaled in the field. Men and women who enter the health sciences as a profession do so from dedication, from a feeling of a need to help people and want to help ill people get well. And certainly there is no deeper gratification than helping a burn patient who is so critically ill when he comes in, not only survive, but go home to his family and return to a useful job in society. And that kind of stimulus uh, in dedicated personnel is what makes this burn center function. No, this is almost typical. The amounts individually are ranging anything from a couple of dollars per individual to as much as uh, many thousands of dollars per person. And uh, it's not unusual at all. Overall, there are something like 800,000 Oklahomans that receive tax refunds uh, during the filing season. And this is about 1,200 that we're out of touch with. That's not unusual. In Oklahoma, we're wanting it to succeed so hard that we will probably write a pretty strict statutory instead of leaving it to a commission members to write this. We have heard that the commission, a strong commission is the best, but where they get in problems is with a weak commission. So in a matter of wanting to succeed, we will probably have it, most of it in our statutes. There they go. Bucks Alive in 75 is going to the front. It's lunchtime at the Hunt Energy Corporation in Oklahoma City, and a dozen lunches have just been prepared. But these are not lunches for hungry employees. This food is to be loaded up and delivered to needy elderly citizens. Taking lunches to those in need during the lunch hour by a private company is being tried for the first time today. The Mobile Meals program is running short of full-time volunteers to deliver lunches. So one of the oil company workers suggested a way to help solve that problem. Once a week, Several employees will act as volunteers for mobile meals. They hope it's an ideal that will catch on. Was it tough getting the people to volunteer? Well, you know, I was surprised. More people volunteered than what I expected. Uh, so it really wasn't. When people heard what it was for and how it was going to help the people here in Oklahoma City, they were for it. Mobile meals. Hi, Velma. The Mobile Meals program is always looking for company employees willing to participate as lunchtime volunteers. You may call 236-0521 if you think your company might be interested. Ed Stewart, Action 4, Northwest Oklahoma City.
It was a reception of the who's who in Oklahoma politics. About 200 lawmakers and hospital administrators came to shake hands with the 70-year-old Raider, many coming all the way from Washington, D.C., those who had worked with him hundreds of times helping Oklahoma get federal funds. Lloyd Raider was appreciative. Well, of course, this is a great day, and I'm gratified and extremely happy and proud. I don't deserve this kind of uh, treatment, but uh, nevertheless, I appreciate it. The reception won't be the last time we'll see Lloyd Rader. He will office at the Oklahoma Memorial Hospital. His office is surrounded by dark colored glass windows. Always a private man, he will continue to finish what he started. Bella Shaw, Action 4. It was Lloyd Raider's last commission meeting as head of the Human Services Department. The time for pleasantries was short, with the department facing severe budget reductions brought on by sharp drops in state sales tax revenues. Already, the Welfare Department has cut back spending by 10 percent, as opposed to the 5.5 percent reductions Governor Nye wants from other state agencies. The commission says the state needs to provide assistance, but along the way, the department has picked up the cost for several non-assistance programs. They would like to pass those programs on to help lighten their load. Uh, one of the examples that uh, uh, was cited in there is the fact that we are having to fund the architectural uh, studies uh, for the College of Osteopathic Medicine in Tulsa. Now, we know that that's a very worthwhile project and should be carried out, but whether or not it should come out of the state assistance fund is another question. Rader plans to finish the new budget before he retires at the end of the month. Miller says he will cut out the non-assistance programs the department has carried as a way of trimming. While those programs don't fit under human services, some of them are needed, and the governor and the legislators will either have to find new funding sources for them or reject Raider's plan. Charles Schnitzer, Action 4. To protect the religious freedom that we are guaranteed, we must keep the government out of it, not have the government be the authority. If the government can establish that religious practice, that government can take it away too, can take away people's religious freedom. Well, I think the, the gut issue really is free speech involved in this case. They're, the plaintiffs are trying to prohibit uh, Little Axe School District from allowing students on a voluntary basis to gather prior to school and uh, have what they call sharing sessions. They have speakers come in and talk to them. And the ACLU and the plaintiffs in this case are trying to prohibit that. The plaintiffs are trying to prove that voluntary preschool sharing sessions violated the constitutional guarantee of separation of church and state. Little Axe school parent Harold Watts testified that his children had to wait outside the school building during those weekly sharing sessions. Students who chose to attend the meetings were allowed to wait for school to start inside the warm building. The plaintiff's 15-year-old son Robert testified that some of his classmates accused him of devil worship because he refused to participate in the sharing sessions. Robert said someone placed an upside down cross on his school locker door about that same time. The plaintiff's three other sons also testified that they were pressured to participate in the sessions. They also complained that students who attended the meetings were given preferential treatment.
Y'all come on up. Two faces that are synonymous with rodeo took the podium at the Stockyards Exchange today to kick off the 1982 National Finals Rodeo. Oklahoma native Ben Johnson and Sausage King Jimmy Dean are in town to be co-grand marshals of the annual National Finals Rodeo Parade. That parade will make its way through the historic Stockyards area tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. These two men are no strangers to Oklahoma, and Jimmy Dean says he enjoys making his way home. I like this part of the country. I'd like to come back. I don't know if I want to do a, a big, you know, arena type show, but I'd like to do it somewhere where we can attain a little in intimacy and have some fun with a bunch of fine people. I like this town. Come on up here, Punch. Come here. Get down there, Mama. The celebrities will be around for several days signing autographs and enjoying the rodeo. The main event at the NFR will get underway at 7 o'clock tomorrow evening at the Myriad Convention Center. If you don't already have tickets to the rodeo, don't expect to get in. The NFR is the biggest money-making attraction in Oklahoma City. Kurt Autry, Action 4. Well, it puts us off the chart, it really does. Our, our sales just blip way, way up high. It's, uh, it's like having two Christmases back to back. It's very strong for us economically. I don't think that there's anybody that's smart enough uh, or a computer that's big enough to hold the information that could really tell us what an economic boon the national finals is to Oklahoma City. Under the proposed bill, road fuel would be taxed another five cents a gallon. The nickel tax increase would be earmarked to finance the rebuilding of the nation's roadways. The additional revenues would mean millions of dollars in road improvement funds for each state. It's projected Oklahoma could receive approximately $80 million a year if the proposed fuel tax were passed. It will give an added funding and hopefully will double what funding we have and maybe more than that from the federal level which will give us an opportunity to make road improvements that we absolutely do not have the resources to do. Consumers would pay into the road improvement fund with each gallon of gas purchased. That's a proposal some motorists aren't too excited about, particularly truckers. When people get in my pocket I don't get excited. Every time it comes to someone getting money they always come to your people that are out here on the road day in and day out we have no choice on it do you drop peter to pay paul what you're doing so basically you say no, no. way not us again no no that's right not us again if the fuel tax proposal passes each state will get back at least 85 percent of the money their motorists pay debbie mash action four
first place, that's just not a true statement. There are uh, punitive measures that may be taken against uh, companies in the nuclear industry, very serious punitive measures, uh, very great fines, very great financial penalties. Uh, I don't think you can grow without comparing what you believe to what other people do and in talking about what you believe and having the ability to practice it out uh, in the way you live your life. And I don't think you can grow by keeping your beliefs at home and not expressing them. So uh, in that sense, this is essential to maximizing the growth of the children's moral development in the schools. This would be essential. These things have a higher thrust. The large uranium molecule is hit by a neutron and breaks into two fission particles, releasing three other neutrons, which become energetic and give you a source of energy. However, in nuclear fusion, you're taking the opposite end of the periodic scale, or the smallest elements there are, hydrogen, which comes in the form of deuterium and tritium, they're isotopes of hydrogen, and you fuse them together so that you wind up with helium which is a, uh, an inert gas, and the energetic neutron. And the energetic neutron is in the part we want to make energy. Nuclear power has become a very controversial area with Three Mile Island, the Black Fox nuclear power plant, which was eventually abandoned in northeastern Oklahoma. Won't the same constraints that have affected that industry affect fusion in the future at some date? Yes, they could. They definitely could. Fusion, however, is a much more benign form of energy in that you're using hydrogen. Your waste product is helium, which is an inert, inert gas. And as an inert gas, it's just a, as harmless as anything could possibly be. Just hours after being rushed to the hospital yesterday morning, 22-year-old Kevin Simmons died. Officer Simmons was shot down shortly after 2.30 Thursday morning while making a routine traffic stop near Northeast 36th and Spencer Road. Police officers from seven communities searched the scene for evidence. Their investigation led to the arrest of 21-year-old Scott Moore. Moore was found in Chickasha in this 1979 Chevy pickup. He had been shot twice in the abdomen. Officers are still searching for a second suspect in the slain, 25-year-old Tolly Earl Melvin. Full name is Tolly Earl Melvin. He's about 25 years old, Negro male. He's about 5'10", 165, 170 pounds. Uh, he's really would look to be sort of slender, uh, but his muscles would be developed fairly well on his arms. Police have no motive in the killing. Moore has been charged with first-degree murder, and officers are still searching for Melvin. Debbie Mash, Action 4.